Hello and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by FinPro Search Partners, the executive search form for the insure tech industry on an international basis. We'd love to hear from you. If you want to hear a bit more about our recruitment services, please visit www.wearefinpro.com. I hope you enjoy the episode. Good morning and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance podcast. I'm your host, Alex Bond, and I'm very lucky today to be joined by Tom Clark, who is Chief um, EV Officer at Abakai. Tom, good morning. Good morning, Alex. Thanks for having me. No, not at all. Well, we were just discussing off air that we uh, we realised that we we all work fairly close to each other, and we, we could have actually done this face to face, which would have been nice. But um, where are you? Are you in sunny ish North London today? Yeah, but... sunny sunny ish North London. Sunny but very cold North London today. <laughs> yeah, I did a I did a call with a client yesterday who was in California, and he couldn't work out why I was in. Uh, some massive jumper <laughs> and another another cardigan around it, and I was like, "Yeah, no, it's it's pretty cold at the moment." So, um, which I'm sure doesn't do great for EV vehicles. Um, but before I dive into the podcast, um, and and yeah, I, I think it's always customary for us to throw it over to the guests to introduce themselves. So, you know, Tom, explain your role, uh, uh, what what does Chief EV Officer mean, and and, and obviously introduce Abakai, if you will. Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess I'm Chief EB Officer at Abakai, which stands for Electric Vehicles. Um, so I look after Abakai's EV business, and I think we're doing in the EV space. Abakai is a full stack insure tech. Um, so we have our own um, underwriter, we have our own claims company and our own distribution. So our, our go to market brand is Boom, which you might see on the, the price comparison sites. Um, and we we're founded um, by Mark Wilson, who obviously used to run Aviva. Um, we've been going now for coming up for 18 months, two years. Um, I have about 45, 50,000 customers on our Boom brand. Um, along with my, my work at Abakai, I also sit on the advisory board for a car subscription company called Voltric. So they specialize in EV car subscription. And pre my time in the startup world, I spent uh, 13 years in corporate uh, working for LV um, and where I head up all of their electric car work. We launched their electric car insurance proposition back in 2019. Um, they basically founded and set up what became Electrics, which is their EV car leasing business, um, and left there in 21. Awesome, awesome. which is about the time we 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 met. Although no relation to your role at Abakai, sadly for me, um, in the recruitment industry. But um, uh, thank you for that introduction, and, and I I really really genuinely wanted to get you on board. And you know we we have all sorts of kind of like weird and wonderful. Uh, businesses and propositions and but I think EV is 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 such an interesting one for me just personally because you know it's I was telling you you know my friends are all sort of we're all early 40s we're all kind of most people look like young families they're all sort of having that decision about the next big car and EV something they're looking at um uh, I might ask you for some tips on tips on that later but I think from the insurance industry perspective you know it's becoming a sort of mainstream thing to have a, a, an electric vehicle. It's it's not that rare to see them on the road anymore. But like, how from an insurance perspective, how does this change the way that we look? We will need to look at car insurance. Yeah. So ultimately, there is a train of thought, and it, it's right. The, it's a box with four wheels fundamentally. Right. The core risks that you're underwriting are exactly the same, as, no matter what powertrain you've got in there. But that misses some of the nuance in an EV. So actually the risk profile is slightly different because you've got supercar acceleration in business saloons. You know, yeah. I remember at LV, when you first got a Tesla Model S, you were more likely to crash in the first six weeks of ownership than at any other time of owning a car. And the reason being was you had um, people going from, you know, BMW business saloons to this Tesla Model S but all of a sudden you had a car that if you had it, you know, in ludicrous mode could do not to 60 in 2.5 seconds. Yeah. You know, we've now yeah. got the Kia EV6 GT that we were just talking about um, off air. It's a family SUV that will do not to 60 in three and a half seconds. You're talking Lamborghini speeds off the line in a family SUV. The yeah. torque is insane in these cars. So, you know, that becomes more important. Top speed becomes less important. Um, thinking about as well from a, a claims point of view well actually you need to have a different um claim setup you know tomorrow you or i go to a body shop and start repairing 
petrol and, and diesel cars. But actually, if you want to re repair an EV, you suddenly come under regulations for um, dealing with high voltage systems. So there's you know a, a regulation aspect there. You've got to have IMI level three, level four qualifications really to know what you're doing in dealing with high voltage systems. You've got to have different tools and kit. You've got to be able to charge and discharge the car. You've got to have insulated tools, matting, even a hook to pull someone off a car should they electrocute themselves. Wow. So wow. there's all these different components in the whole value chain that we need to consider. Um, we also then need to look at parts and what that means. So where's the charging port on a car? You know, if the charging port is at the front of a car, then you've got to, that's most likely to be damaged in a front impact, which is most likely to be a fault claim. And what does that mean in terms of how you rate the risks of individual cars? We've obviously got ADAS technology um, in petrol and diesels and EVs, but you're more likely to see it in an EV than you are in a petrol and diesel just because they have a higher price point. So, okay, that might improve your frequency, but does that impact your severity because you've got to repair the ADAS kit and calibrate the ADAS kit? So there's a whole bunch of different things when we really get into it um, to look at. And then we get to the really, well, I say the fun stuff, the really interesting stuff in terms of an EV is just a computer on wheels, fundamentally. Like there's not as many moving parts. The tech stack becomes way more important. You just look at what Tesla are doing with over the air updates. You know, I can pay to upgrade my car um, or Tesla might push out an update. Um, that allows for new safety features. So for example, in Tesla, I think it was about 2019, they pushed out what's called pin to drive. So if you choose to activate it, you've got to put in a four digit pin into the car for the car to start. So where we see, for example, you know, um, relay attacks where we've seen loads of la uh, Land Rovers and others that have been stolen, we're seeing a spike in theft claims across the industry. Well, actually Tesla have de delivered a solution built into the car. You haven't got to pay for an expensive aftermarket immobilizer is just there and they just did it with a software update mm -hmm. so there's so much going on in the ev space technology is always getting better um residual values are changing all the time as well we're seeing different business models um operate from the oem so i'll pick on tesla but pulsar to also do this they sell directly rather than via dealers so as we saw last week what did tesla decide to do they decided to do a big huge cut in the price of their evs you know tesla model y performance dropped eight grand if you bought it on uh, thursday last week you're paying eight thousand pound more than you're paying on it friday yeah. so that then plays into your residual values which plays into then if you're doing a total loss and what you're paying out for a car so there's all these components that insurers need to be thinking about throughout the whole value chain when they're looking at ev and then we get into proposition and product so when we look at the EV space, it presents a really good opportunity for insurers to do something different. Insurance is, particularly car insurance, a grudge purchase. As much as those of us in the insurance industry would like to think otherwise, mm -hmm. it's price driven um, by the consumer. But EV owners, particularly at the moment, are looking for something different. And we're seeing that in the products that are winning in the space. So uh, when I was at LV, uh, we looked at the market in 2018, it was about 80,000 cars. We could see where it was going. So we launched uh, the LV electric car insurance product in sort of the start of 2019. And it was the first product that was really tailored to EV owners. So there was covers in there like cover for the charging cables, the battery, your home charger that was fairly unique at the time. But the real kind of USP was the fact that when we looked at the, the barriers to adoption, what people were worried about, one of the biggest things that came out was the range of an electric car. And the fact I'm going to run out of charge. Yeah. So sat in LV at the time, we're like, well, we've got a breakdown company in Britannia Rescue. Why don't, if you run out of charge, we'll take you to the nearest charge point or we'll, you know, give you a roadside charge. And the, the perception from the consumer was that was hugely valued. The reality was very rarely claimed on, um, but huge value to it. And we saw, you know, when I left LV, we'd gone from a 9% market share to over 20% market share. And it was product and proposition led. You look at direct line and what they're doing in their space and looking looking from the outside, I think they've been quite smart in the sense of they've taken, a, again, a proposition approach. They've partnered with Zoom EV. So Zoom EV provide a bundle of um, services. You pay about 40 to 50 pounds for it. Um, direct line are giving it for free. 
and it's got about a value in terms of if you used everything in that bundle of sort of three to four hundred pounds so discounts on charging discounts on parking discounts on getting home charges installed mm-hmm. and again i think they've had a real big success with that so those insurers that are going down a a property and product approach are really winning in the space because mm-hmm. consumers are buying an ev going this is different i want my insurance to be different and because there's different risks in there and, and different views it allows insurers to engage in a with a, a consumer in a way they've not been able to do before or really struggled to do. What's the um? What's the market in terms of uh, size of vehicles now? How, how many vehicles are there in the, on the road in the UK? So if we look at, we talk about BEVs and FEVs. So BEVs are battery electric vehicles. FEVs are plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, the key difference being your battery electric vehicle is purely electric. Your plug-in hybrid has a petrol engine in there and has been seen as a stepping stone technology um it's now we've seen the battery electrics far out to sell the, the plug-in hybrids but we talk about both about 1.2 million vehicles so we talk about vehicles with plugs essentially 1.2 million um and that pure electric is, is growing all the time last year in terms of the pure electric battery electric we saw 250,000 new cars sold um if we look at like december sales figures about a third of all new cars sold were electric. Um, even when you look at it to Tesla, we keep coming back to Tesla, but about 13% of all new cars sold were Tesla in December. Wow. So we're really seeing that uptick. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting. My parents were looking at getting a new car and, and I said, oh, you should get, a, you should get an electric. And um, they live in like deepest darkest Devon, like so they're terrified they're going to run out. And I was like, have you looked at the range of some of these things? You know, like you can drive to, you know, it's, it's not really much part of the country you can't go with. You know, as long as you sort of give yourself some time to stop anyway. Um, and that stepping stone. Do you think that stepping stone sort of thought process has been eroded because they've become there's such a psychological element of that, isn't there? That, that, you know, I, I think there seems to be eroding. But see, going for a hybrid now, which is what I consider. Do you think? I don't know if it's worth it anymore. Um, I don't think it is, to, to to be honest. And when you look at the cars now, you can get a car with a 200 mile plus range mm-hmm. for 28,000. So the MG4, yeah. which is a great car that, you know, you look at the MG4, the, the very top spec MG4 is 32. The base is about 26,000. You're talking three, 400 pounds a month on a lease. This is a car that's got 200, over 200 mile range. We'll do ultra rapid charging, 150 kilowatt charging. It's even got what's called vehicle to grid or vehicle to load. So you can charge another car off the MG4. You can power your home off of it. You can power appliances off of it. That's a feature that not even Teslas have built in. You know, the Kia EV6 have it, the Ionic 5's got it, you know, but they're like 40, 50 grand cars. We're talking in a, in a you know, a mid to high 20,000 pound car, this technology. And it's, I think we'll see from the manufacturer point of view, MG is ultimately is a Chinese manufacturer uh, using a UK brand, yeah. we're going to see the likes of Neo and BYD, some of these big Chinese manufacturers that are producing very good cars, far cheaper than what we're used to seeing um, in the UK market come out of the next year or two. And that's really going to disrupt it. And because we've got that range, to, to your point, I think the days of plug-in hybrids are gone. I mean, the longest range car that I can think of is the Lucid Air. Um, now, we are talking about a... 90,000, 100,000 pound car, but it'll do 500 miles on a single charge. Wow. There, there is no way anyone's bladder is lasting longer than 500 miles. <laughs> um, and, and that's the key thing, right? If you're doing a long journey, uh, I always say the bladder test, the, which is going to last longer, your bladder or the, the, the range of the car. I love that. And, I love that. <laughs> and ultimately, so I had uh, most recent EV, I was a VW ID3, and we did. Uh, about a 330 mile each way trip to the Lakes District. Mm-hmm. We had to stop once to charge, but actually we had to stop once because we needed a tea and coffee and to use the the restrooms. So it was and by the time we'd done that, the car was charged because the car was charging it on a ultra rapid charge of 100 kilowatts. Mm-hmm. It doesn't take that long to charge them anymore. People still go the perception of, oh, well, if I plug it in on my home socket, it takes 40 hours to charge. The reality is no one does that. The reality is if you're charging at home using a home charger, which is going to take anywhere from sort of four to eight hours to fully charge a car. Um, and if you're using an ultra rapid charge point, you're maybe, if you've got a really big battery 
um, you're talking 30 to 40 minutes. Okay. What's the, um, I was reading your, I applied your newsletter because one of the things, you know, you and I had connected before, but um, you, you, you write, is it come out every, every Friday or? Every, every Friday week? I publish uh, This Week in EV newsletter uh, via yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah, it's, and, and for anyone out there, it's really good. You should check it out and just definitely um, get it. Because because I'm just fascinated by this world. I mean, I, I clearly, I love technology and innovation. That's why, you know, I've, I've pivoted from doing traditional insurance business and, and then moving into the short term re recruitment business because I just, it's interesting to be at the kind of forefront of things that are innovative. And, and I think you you are so embedded in this and your enthusiasm for it is, is so comes through, but also what i like about your newsletter is it brings up things that i wasn't aware of so what i thought was inf interesting was a couple of things i wanted to ask you on and um, was straying slightly from insurance but but i think i think it's kind of interesting to people anyway is that the energy companies that are kind of getting the charges still seem to be investing in not the super rapid charges and that seems kind of backwards and then also that the reason china appears to be the huge take up in terms of percentage of the population in uh yeah, in EV, ev vehicles appears to be kind of connected to that you know there's a commitment to manufacturing there's a commitment to infrastructure um are we quite far behind in the uk with that i think we are to be honest when we talk about you know manufacturing we saw the failure of british fault this week mm -hmm. and it's a failure of industrial policy fundamentally you know People forget Tesla is always the poster child and look what Tesla's done. But people forget in 2010, the reason Tesla got what it got to is a five about $450 million loan from the Department of Energy. You know, it was subsidized by government. And a lot of the big EV players have been in the past. Building batteries or electric cars are very capital intensive um, industries to be in. They require a level of support. Um, we haven't got the subsidies you can get elsewhere. So whereas we used to have the plug-in grants where home charges were subsidized, where cars were subsidized, they're now all gone, but they still exist elsewhere. You know, in the US now, one of the reasons testing that, that, that big price cut is the new, um, the Biden administration's new um, funding they brought in means you can get a $7,500 uh, credit on a new EV. So actually... If you think about that in the UK, if we were talking, you know, four or five thousand pounds, that would make a Tesla uh, Model Three sub forty thousand pounds. We'd be sort of thirty seven, thirty eight thousand pounds. That MG Four we were talking about would be sort of twenty one, twenty two thousand pounds. Way more affordable means it's easier for someone to buy an EV, but also incentivizes the OEMs to put supply into the country and make the country more attractive as a, a market. The, other, the flip side of that is the the straight grant or the straight loan to the the OEMs. You know, we've seen that um, government support to in other countries. We're not seeing it in the UK. The reason China has done so well, they've been really strong on their industrial policy. It's obviously a slightly different setup because of um, the way their economy works and that command economy. But they've you know prioritised what they call NEVs, new energy vehicles, um, of which you know EV comes under that bucket they've subsidized it they've incentivized industry to do that they've obviously got a huge market they've now got the full supply chain you know we only have one gigafactory um, up towards Sunderland in the UK without British Vault and you look at where the the plans or um, future gigafactories are and where they're currently being built they're just not in the UK and they just won't be without strong industrial policy from government uh, unfortunately the government wants to support EV adoption through policies that cost it any money um, or doesn't involve putting cash down, but it's just not going to work. Mm. You know, if mm. British Vault might not have been the right company, but if that 100 million loan commitment that um been given by government had been given to them, they would have still be going and I'm probably more on track than they ended up being. Um, so unless that changes, I think we could certainly in the long term really struggle to have the components that we need for a strong UK electric car industry. But there are some, some bright shoots out there, you know, in terms of uh, there's a company looking at lithium mining in Cornwall. So there are big lithium deposits in Cornwall that are being explored. That could be a really strong area there. There's um, a couple of a company, I think it's like Liverpool Way, looking at kind of the, the refinement process and what can be done there. So there are the green shoots that we could have an electric car supply chain in the UK but it requires action from government. Um, and if we don't have that, 
And I guess to the, the other point that you said there around some of the oil and gas companies and what they're looking at putting in the ground in terms of charges. So there are some really good charging companies out there, um, but they generally aren't the ones owned by BP or Shell or any of the oil and gas companies. I'm thinking of Instavolt, I'm thinking of Osprey, I'm thinking of GridServe. They've just nailed the requirements, which are, it's not rocket science, right? What does a uh, an EV owner want? They want to be able to find a charge that works, that's fast and it's easy to use. It's as simple as that. Um, and they are putting in the ground, you know, 150 kilowatt plus chargers. Grid server are, are opening a new charging hub near um, Stonehenge. They're all 350 kilowatt power chargers. These are the fastest chargers you can get. So when we see, you know, BP announcing they're buying uh, more Triton chargers, they're buying a bunch of 150 kilowatt ones, which is great, but they're also buying a bunch of 50 kilowatt ones, which is, it feels like 2016, 2017 technology now, when you talk about buying a 50 kilowatt charger. Mm. Yeah, I, I saw that. I, was like, I, I didn't even know the speed, but I was just like, if the if there's a 350 one in existence, 50, yeah, it seems like a trickle versus a tidal wave of energy. Um, what is that? The policy thing's kind of re really interesting, but um, I wanted to kind of take that point as well about manufacturing it and, and what it's really interesting that a lot of the EV companies are doing, which is, you know, selling direct, controlling that whole kind of manufacturing ecosystem all the way down to insurance. And, and we've seen them loads of the kind of um, EV vehicle companies and even mainstream I think I might say even sort of mainstream manufacturers when they're talking about their EV vehicles, they're, they're sort of moving towards kind of having the whole kind of soup to nuts value chain covered. Um, it, how does that impact from an insurance perspective? Why do you, why in your opinion are they taking that view? Is it something that's kind of inherent in EV vehicles that that that's necessary? Yeah, so I'd, I'd summarize it as the Apple versus Android approach. So let's look at Tesla who are taking the Apple approach, which says we're going to own the entire ecosystem because we a, understand the technology better. We can then make money across the whole ecosystem so that we can do you know, big price cuts to our cars because we're going to make money elsewhere down the line as well. They also then understand where, and then we're getting into connected car territory now, where the cars are connected. They've got all this technology, the data coming off the car. They're like, well, we understand the driver better. We understand the car better. So we should do the insurance. And you've seen this now in the States where, Tesla are going, you know, they're heading towards full stack insurer in the States. Uh, and I expect that to go everywhere because they've taken this very much this Apple approach of owning everything. VW are, are probably going in a similar vein. Um, and it comes down to the tech stack fundamentally that they're building. So Tesla have built their own tech stack. And it's the whole point is EVs are computer on wheels. It's all their own tech. VW built their own tech stack. They've got their own um, software division. Um, and they've taken a similar approach. But then you've got the Android approach, and the best example of that would be Polestar. You know, the Polestar 2 is a, a great EV they built from the ground up, but they've fully embraced literally Android, and their entire operating system is based off of Android. It's an Android operating system. They've outsourced that all to Alphabet. So they're thinking we're going to make the car and someone else is going to do the tech, and we will therefore partner where it makes sense to partner uh, and do the ecosystem that way. So we've got these two competing models. It'll be interesting to see kind of, which works best and, and you know there there's pros and cons to both approach you know the tester approach you can make more money across the whole value chain but does everyone want to get an insurance you know a car insurance is particularly in the uk is a, a hugely competitive market it's very price driven you can very quickly lose your shirt and there's not massive margins there's a perception i think uh that insurers are all sat there on piles of money uh, raking it in when we're not paying out claims but the reality is there isn't much money in insurance really the, the market hovers between profitable and loss making and it looks like you know for 22 is going to be a loss making year for the market uh can they get better can car uh, manufacturers get better returns elsewhere than deploying capital into insurance so, so i think we'll see a mix so i think we will see the likes of tesla the likes of um maybe vw i'm not so sure but certainly the newer oems maybe the lucids of the world going down the insurance route because they a, haven't got dealers to worry about is they're owning the whole value chain they can be more flexible they have the data coming off the car and utilizing that data um but yeah i think for the last five ten years across insurance we've been worrying about tech players eating our lunch in terms of 
entering the market. You know, Amazon recently launched their um, product, which is really a slightly underwhelming price comparison site. Uh, you know, Google had um, Google Compare, which they shut down. Um, it's interesting one. I think insurance is harder than people realize. I, I was thinking that as you were talking about that, I was like, you know, we've, we've been doing the podcast for a couple of years now and, and the theme thematically there's sort of a uh, we can do it better and, it, and then there, there's almost been an element of tail between legs going you know these insurers kind of know what they're doing um that's not to say there's not evolution to be had and learnings to be had and clearly you know from a technology standpoint when technology evolves this fast you know it'd be ridiculous to assume that insurers have got the handle on everything but you know pricing risk understanding risk you know understanding what's insurable versus what isn't um and and, and modeling risk you know He's done almost better in the insurance space because I'm watching with interest. I, I, I spoke to the guy that set the Tesla insurance up um, originally, and, and originally they used a sort of MGA platform, and now obviously they're going for the sort of more full, they're going for a full stack setup. Um, it's very interesting to see because you go to, to a certain extent. I, I'm like, why, why bother? You know, you could have branded it as you. You could still sell as much, probably make be much more profitable selling it on you know some sort of mga format and, and just distributing it another way but you know that, that that is that apple analogy um uh versus android and i have got an irrational hatred for uh apple product. uh i haven't actually it's because anyone that my team has a uh, bring your own technology uh thing so some of them have got apple products anytime one of their cables breaks they have to replace it it's always like <laughs> five to ten times the price of anything else which is the thing that upsets me um but moving on I, we can't talk about the manufacturing of EV without getting into the kind of environmental element and that's the one thing that i think i don't understand that and i think that's one of my challenges with it um, particularly things like cobalt mining and i've got nice smartphones so you know i, I can't be too smug about the whole thing but um there is some inherent environmental risks in in ev which are kind of very specific to ev and demands on that um i just kind of want to understand you know your stance on it really because that's the main argument people have with the manufacturing of sort of ev the mining process particularly yeah and let's not get ourselves if we are buying any product there's a carbon footprint right like, that there is there is a degree of uh, resource utilization no matter what but we've been using kind of batteries in in laptops and phones for a while now and everyone keeps fairly quiet about it um yes there is there is an environmental impact to mining there are ways to make it more sustainable and there are people out there you know doing their bits around that there are concerns around when you talk about that sort of mining around, around water usage and it's not just lithium and cobalt don't forget you know you need a lot of copper you know, a lot of wiring and around you know how do we do that in a sustainable way um but also when you look at the the overall carbon footprint of an ev initially it's higher than an internal combustion engine but by the time you've driven depending on you know the, the grid mix and everything else anywhere from six to twelve thousand miles it's way better than a petrol and diesel car because you're stopping that pollution even if you've got a really intensive grid so like a grid that's all gas and coal for example the ev is still going to be better because it's more energy efficient so from energy generation through to what you're using in your wheels you're using about 70 percent of the energy generated yep. in a petrol and diesel car we're talking 15 20 percent so it will always be um more energy efficient which therefore means you're less energy intensive we've also got a lot of new materials coming on stream in terms of new technologies you know, we've got, um, uh, funny enough, in this week in EV uh, today, I saw, I mentioned around an oxygen carbon battery, this technology that's coming along, we talk about solid state batteries that are coming. Um, the degree of the kind of rarer materials that are in them is getting less and less. We've obviously got um, lithium iron as the main kind of battery chemistry, but we've also got lithium iron phosphate that's coming on. Um, so again, slightly different chemistries some trade-offs in terms of energy density there. But again, all these chem chemistries are improving all the time. So whilst, yeah, you know, let's not shy away from the fact there is an environmental impact. If we look at the environmental impact of an EV versus a petrol and diesel car, the EV is much better um, and will be much better, will get only get better over the life of its use. Mm -hmm. Whereas a petrol and diesel car will only get worse over the life of its use. Of course. Yeah, um, of course. 
Oh, ultimately, um, the be best thing we can all do is uh, probably get on bicycles. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I always say that my favourite way to travel is train. I love going on yeah. the train. Um, you know, I can read, I can, <laughs> let's be honest, I can have a drink, I can eat, you know, I can do all the things that we, we kind of want to do. Um, yeah, if they get that infrastructure right. But it's 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 blended transport infrastructure we need, isn't it? We do need cycle lanes, like, you know, every time I'm abroad in, you know, in Europe, you know, Berlin or Amsterdam, and, and you just think this is so much easier, you know, good luck with that in London. I know lots of my friends and colleagues cycle, and I just think you're braver than me. Um, uh, working trains, lots of and then EV is part of that. Um, yeah, EV is just one component, right? EV helps us in our kind of fight with climate change and reducing our emissions. It helps with our air pollution. But if we change every car in London tomorrow to an EV, we're still going to have a problem with congestion. That's still going to be there fundamentally, right? Um, so if we really want to make the shift, as you said, Amsterdam's a great example where they've shifted to kind of bicycles. And it's, it's about really like multimodal transport, you know, if it's a shorter, if it's an under five mile journey, can you cycle it? Um, if you can walk it in half an hour, can you walk it rather than take a car? It's it's about shifting how we travel across the piece. And EV is just one component of a wider ecosystem of travel. Mm. It's it's funny to talk, think about EV in, in that terms as well, because if you think about, I think about the way EVs are being developed, they're being developed to cope with um, the lives and the relationships we have with our transport now if we change the relationship we have with travel and change the relationship we have with cars because a lot of people have got cars i used to live in brighton and quite often drove into london because it was cheaper for me to do so and it was quicker and and, and more reliable so i would like drive in and, and park up and then and then get the last tube stop on the way um i didn't feel like i could have an ev for a long time because i didn't think the range was there now i know the range is there i know i don't need that range like for example, if you sold me a super cheap EV that did like 50 mile range and that was all it's ever anticipated to be, and I'm a single guy, I don't have children, and I'm like, with probably one seat and it was like 10 grand, I, you know, that, that's perfect. You know, there, there must be a world where we start to kind of move to. Yeah. I'm, trying, I'm basically describing the Sinclair C2 or whatever it was. No, no, actually, you're describing the Citroen Amy, which is out. Oh, so right. You've literally described the Citroen Amy, which is about. Uh, I think the deposit's about two thousand pounds, and then it's literally twenty pounds a month. Um, yeah. And it is it is only a city car. I think its top speed's like thirty miles an hour. It's probably got a, a range of 30, 40 miles. It's a tiny battery, but it's exactly what you've described there, right? And, and these are this sort of micro car is starting to emerge in the EV space. Yeah, and it serves that's exactly the niche you've described there. Sad, lonely guys based in Lewisham. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I think it's 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 that thing, isn't it? It's that it's it. That's the thing that actually fits in with my lifestyle. You know, I, I've yeah. got I've got a car. My kind of environment view is that um, you know I, I, I'm vegan. I don't bang on about it too much, and I'm not the best vegan. But I used to be quite militant about it. But if you live in Brighton, it's a lot easier than it is uh here um but um but that was for environmental reasons i bought i've got a very old car i've got a 16 year old golf uh which is having an mot today so i'll decide whether that was a good idea or not um but the you know it, it's my relationship with vehicles is kind of all, almost old-fashioned but then i sort of take a step back i don't even know if i need a car so subscription as well is something that we've seen evolve and do you, do you think we'll see that as well do you, do you, car ownership in itself is is kind of arguably a threat you know do i even need one um, yeah if I do, do I need to own it it's a great point and uh, i guess this is where i plug my other uh part-time job so they're working for the guys at Voltric and what they're doing so yeah, and, and, <laughs> yeah that's that's it it's my proper plugs in now it's like buy, buy boom ev and buy and go buy Voltric. uh there you go um now i think it's one where car subscription is super interesting and i think it's got two functions if you like in the market right now the first is people moving to EV because it is different. So you can't, whilst it, you can do these long journeys, the charging is there, you've got a plan. You've got to know. So that example I had, yeah, where I did went from Kent to the lakes, I knew exactly where I was stopping. I knew where the charge points were. I knew what speeds they were. And I made sure it was a, a reliable network. So you've got to do that plan of the journey. Where the 
the likes of Voltric um, and others come in is the fact that actually, well, I've got the car, uh, I've got the charging, and I've got access to multiple networks via a single um, RFID card or app. I've got the insurance. I've got it all. I'm not going to worry about it. So I can try it for a month, six months, a year and see, is it right for me? If I'm also someone who's worried about, well, is the battery going to run out in a year's time? Uh, which it won't, but let's say, you know, people are thinking about the battery in their iPhone versus the, the battery in the car. They're very different and it will last them a lot longer. But they might be thinking, well, actually, I might want to wait for the next iteration. Technology was getting better. That is a great entry point um, for it. And also where you can swap cars. So you might have a, a Renault Zoe for six months and then be like, well, actually, I need to do a really long journey with the whole family. So maybe I need to get a big, maybe I need a Tesla Model Y long range for a month or two. Now I can swap it and then swap back. I think that's interesting. And I think as well, the other area is where people need a car for a period of time but they don't know how long that is. So if you've you know, uh, moved somewhere and you're like, well, we're here for a year, I don't know what we're doing after that, then a car subscription is a great way to do that because you're not tied in in the same way. Um, and actually, when you look at the cost versus leasing with insurance, it's not that different. So I think we're going to see car subscription grow more with EV. It works, it works well in the EV space. Um, and it is just quite a hassle-free way of doing it and making that switch. And it, and it bleeds so, if you think about our relationship with car insurance, particularly in the UK, it's so price sensitive and it is a begrudge for, you know, begrudging purchase. You don't, it's not even like travel, like, like travel is a insurance that most people buy, obviously you don't have to, but I, I think most people do buy it. Uh, I, I'm sure some travel insurance nerd will email me in and tell me the statistics, but what I mean is you can buy bad cover. So, you know, you can yeah. get some actually doesn't cover you whereas realistically insurance cover in the uk is pretty ubiquitous in terms of core car insurance you know you want your know, full comp cover and you want it as cheap as possible and you don't really care about the ins and outs of it apart from the, maybe figuring out what your excess is um so subscriptions and embedded insurance is just so perfect for that environment because it, it, it is a current it's an insurance that people don't care about you know we care about it because we're insurance people but, but most people are thinking you know, I, there was a point where I didn't know what my insurer was, and I'm an insurance guy. I used to work in motor insurance, and I was thinking, I don't know who my insurer is. Uh, I know I'm insured because, you know, I, I paid it, but I couldn't even remember, and I couldn't find it for ages. So I think getting into that subscription space is interesting. Um, I'm very really conscious of your time, and I wanted to sort of, you know, talk about what's coming up, particularly the innovation insurance products and proposition. Just kind of finishing on this, like what what are the sort of new opportunities, new products that are really exciting to you? Um, yeah, as we as we sort of enter this new year. Yeah, so I think from the core insurance, I think we'll see more um, features in terms of risks that we can co cover. The, the current, I think, debate I've had in LV and in Avakai is around, for example, trip liability on a charging cable. So if uh, I'm plugged in. Uh, my charging cable is dangling on the pavement because I'm using a, a street charger. Someone trips over. Do I, as the insurer, cover that liability? Um, some insurers do, some don't. The question is, are, if you cover it, are you creating a moral hazard? How, we're going to go into a tough part of the cycle for insurers. We therefore will see more fraud. If my car is plugged in charging for 12 hours uh, and then someone says, well, I tripped over your charging cable and... Uh, want to make a claim how do you know if that's fraud or not so i think that becomes really interesting some of those sorts of nuance that will get shaped out eventually as ever with these things there will be a court case that decides whether insurers have to cover it or not but at the moment we don't so you know does it apply under a use of vehicle or not um i think we'll see those sort of things covered you know um more products that are thinking about the the needs of ev owners so we launched Boom EV very quietly at the back end of last year, and we'll, we'll roll out more. It covers the basic things like you know charging cables, your home charge point, the battery. Um, but certainly, the way we'll take it going forward is, it, as any kind of good insure tech should, what are the new customer pain points that will emerge over time that we can solve? I think as well, thinking about how we can go to more engagement with EV owners. So how can we as insurers move to 
that sort of vitality model of doing engagement, but not, which insurers have done before many times. Well, we've created an app and you can put your car details in the app. And it look, you've got a nice 3D model of your car. Now, can we can we give you a route planner or a charging map? Can we partner with a provider that's going to discount you on your charging? Um, can we you know, help you in terms of as we get connected car, thinking about nudges around, well, actually, you know, you could improve your drive by doing X or Y. So it's a sort of an evolution of telematics, um, but not in the same way. I think there's some really interesting opportunities that EV presents that we can do different things on. Um, and I think it's up to insurers to really think, what can we do? The other thing is thinking about the capacity in the market. So if you go and get a, a price on a BMW tomorrow on compare the market and you do it on your Tesla five minutes later, you'll get a lot more quotes for your BMW than your Tesla. There are still some insurers that don't really want to write EVs um, or aren't really thinking about it because there's, you know, what, 35, 36 million cars on the road, something like that in the UK. There's only 1.2 million of them are EVs. That's fine. I can avoid that bit of the market at the moment. But in 2024, if the zero emission um, vehicle mandate comes into effect, that means that at minimum one in five will have to be electric. By 2030, a hundred percent of new cars sold will have to be zero emission. It's coming very quick. And any insurer that's kind of not thinking about this now is only building a problem for themselves in five years time because those insurers that have moved early have got the data understand the risk and it's the virtuous circle of underwriting and pricing right they've got the data which means they write more which means they get more data which means they can price better yeah absolutely um tom i'm gonna to stop you there because otherwise um, i can talk to you for ages about this because you must be the most knowledgeable person in the country about this uh, space but um no i'm really glad we got a chance to do that um before yeah we let you go um remind us of your newsletter again because i think everyone should subscribe it's, uh... yeah so it's uh this week in ev you can find it on linkedin uh if you head to my linkedin page you can subscribe to it there yeah and it's genuinely interesting and it's not that long so it's yes, a li little snapshot of the industry so um yeah it's really really good um I, I think everyone should subscribe tom it's been a pleasure thank you so much for being a guest on the leadership and insurance podcast thanks a lot for having me alex thank you Thank you so much for listening to the Leadership and Insurance podcast. As ever, this is brought to you by FinPro Search Partners, the executive search firm for the insure tech industry on an international basis. If you want to find out more about what we do from a recruitment standpoint, please visit www.wearefinpro.com. 